okay? Everyday of photography, whether it's camera, whether it's single lens reflex, or whether it is digital, we have it all. Today, I'm out painting his broad stroke. Temperature dependent, today it's minus six at least. Are going to stop? Four, three, two, one. my way. Perfect day, overcast, cool, just a little skiff of snow. I'll focus on detail, little details, little texture that Jack left behind last night. It's about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Who cares? It's just got a really nice little fuzzy. So just, should I just try to pick up some little pockets of snow? So, you know, you can, this is what I usually do when I do it all on my own. So I just like the kind of the patterns that the snow leaves. Oh, this doesn't bother me at all. I actually quite like the patterns that uh, are left behind. It's all about transformation to, for me as well. Yeah. You notice my new pair of glasses? This is so I can see actually close. The other ones are progressive glasses. But today, because there is a little bit of a subtle change in the weather, it's not quite wet, it's not quite winter, and it's not quite summer, but it's definitely cold enough to be Definitely cold enough to be below zero, which it is. 
zero, right, the freezing, of, uh, freezing temperature of water. That's when Jack comes out. He's temperature dependent. The only time Jack comes out is when it's zero or below. What do you think Jack does when it's warm? I don't know why Jack goes when it's warm. I mean, that's part of the little idea of developing a storyline. I'm just trying to record him as Jack as a painter. So that's what he's doing today. It's very late for him, of course, but earlier this morning when I started my van, there was really, really neat pictures of him. And I think at the shoreline here of the water, you'll see his uh, presence as well. Although it's not so much frost, it's more ice. Well, whoever Jack Frost is, I think in some folklore, like in German folklore, he's actually a female, or she. Winter, early winter is a female. And Peter would be so proud to know that if I was going to do it proper, I would actually research to find out how many other types of folklore or, or, or even cultures consider Frost to be a feature or precursor to winter. It is leaf change, but it can stay, the ground won't freeze forever. You know, there's times when winter won't appear until much before Christmas, right? A green Christmas is what? No snow. I think most people associate winter with snow, not necessarily with with just temperature. Yeah. Yeah. And now we go. I'm off to the river. So follow me. You just down around this bend is the Rita River. And they drain the Rita River at, uh, at this time of year to uh, facilitate the ice movement in the spring. All these sheets of ice that come down the river, they don't try to back it up. So it's a wonderful opportunity to see the the subsurface of the water, which is really quite magical. So that's where we're going to go. Right. And then you might want to, you might want to position your camera. Six, five, four, five, three, two, one. Another sound of fall, and geese. If you're painting, sometimes they're really broad. This is just a very fine little textured stroke. And it really, really accentuates the, uh, the composition of the ground, I think. Well, this isn't so much heat. today, not a, none of it. But I'm sort of trying to set a framework for them, I guess. Besides, this is the only chance I've had to shoot in, in quite a while. I miss shooting. When I was working early in the morning, I could get out a lot earlier. Now that I work at lunchtime, I don't get the same privilege. It's like being in, like being in prison. It's a little trick I've learned. 
Peter never liked the fact that there was no people or people in my picture, so I decided that I would use myself as scale just to give it a, a definition, and it really does help, you know, like sort of scale. Or, so that's what I'm doing. So now I don't know if you want me to go on the other side, walk through to the water, or if you want to do a reference shot of the water. And this is something else that I'm learning, eh? You can probably do a reference. It's just so neat. It's this little um, piece of ice that's been formed around the branch, and as the water passes, sometimes it sucks the branch and the ice into the water. So it's got this constant movement of almost like uh, tapping up and down. It's just interesting movement. Come see this. This is really, come see it. It's really, really interesting. I mean, like, go figure. So there, there's what I'm framing. What? Watch, 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 And of course my, my demented line idea, this tripod's odd. I love that little movement. So because it's overcast, Colors are much truer. The colors are actually real. There's no glare, there's no uh, prism of light passing through the crystals of the ice. It makes for a much more uh, wholesome, shall we say, composition. Accurate. What's, what's the right word, Mike? Help me. Well, Monochromatic, <laughs> for, for, the, for the, the light, something that has a true light. No, it's more than gravity. It's, it's got a lot to do with them. Um, and you see, of course, like, when I want to go out, I quite often go free of people. I really love the fact that Mother Nature sort of designs things of her own free will. I learn an awful lot from Mother Nature, only because I, I try to position myself in a place where I can actually enjoy her for what she truly is.
this. When I do a pan, although I don't like this tripod for pans. I'm not sure. I think it's just because it's a new type of tripod. I think when you're using single lens reflex, it's a lot easier just to cla cl you know, shoot a shot. Whereas with a tripod, you, you, me, I try to keep the movement steady. Yeah. I'm not so good with the handheld as well. And although now I would really have trouble with the handheld because it's so cold. But uh, watching the other day with Peter, how nice you can move a camera around by, by just wrestling with it. It has some really nice effects when you yank it off the tripod and uh, position it quickly and, and uh, aggressively and do some very positive shots. And that was a learning curve for me too because I never realized that we could, could actually do that. I was much more structured and formal in trying to have perfect hold of, of, of picture without motion in it or without movement in it. And now I'm beginning to realize that, you know what, uh, 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 it ain't going to happen more. I'm going to start really sticking it in people's faces. But still, it's just the, the, the composition that's out there now. Like right now, what I'm shooting, I'm just shooting really subtle details along the, the water's edge. You've got the movement of the water lapping against the shore, and then you've got just, for me, I just find it really, really interesting, the light change. Um, now, I mean, it's getting darker, but the color of the, the film and the fact that you've got liquid and solid just is a really neat extra feature. Plus, I'm shooting everything at a 60th. This is the first time I've ever done that, so I'm really going to be excited about seeing how much light is going to come into it. You know, that's a learning curve for me as well. Tremendous amount of a learning curve this whole thing is. And there's my line. If you follow this shoreline, if you follow that ice, where is that leading? I don't know. And I was thinking today, Mike, in my state of address, that um, I'm talking more about communication lines than lines of narrative. Quick change of glove just to keep the hand from freezing. It's a little bit cold. I can still even think of Tony with his hand on today. Could you imagine how cold his hand would be today? <laughs> so I'm trying to catch the, the water. The water obviously stained the bulrushes this summer, so since they've drained it, I'm trying to create that image of water stain, water line. And then I'm going to go back. I saw the little rumple on the uh, ice back here, which I really liked. Makes a really well, great. I mean, like, that's the thing. Just figure to start seeing a little bit about... Well, and I, I'd get out here, and when I was a kid, I'd be gone for hours. I, I'd be gone all day. A friend of mine, I got caught on the bridge up here. My friend Jimmy Sharp. I jumped off, I was too terrified to jump off when the train came by and I ran. It's like a scene out of Stand By Me. I ran to this little platform and I watched this train go by. 
And ever since then, I have had real trouble walking across the train. But Jimmy, he saw the train coming, and he was running, and he just jumped off this bridge right into the water. We were all of like 12 years old. Never told our mothers about it. Hell no. But the whole adventure started because we saw the leg of a dog on the railway track, so we thought if we could find some more of it. So this, this, uh, this little area was just a real playground for me as a kid. I used to come here a lot by myself. I had a dog of my own. And, uh, like, look at it. <laughs> used to play uh, bow and arrows. There was a couple of twins, Andy and, uh, Andy and Robbie Patterson, and we made these bows and arrows, and we crushed them with bow rushes one time, and we hid with these make, make bow and arrows. And we said, the next flock of birds that flew over, we'll let go of these arrows and see if we can't hit one. Well, sure enough, after a thousand tries, we actually launched and we, uh, one of us pierced this poor little bird right with one of these arrows and went right through it and the thing fell out of the ground. And it was like, there we were, where the, what is it, where did the, where did the pigs, what was the one with the uh, piggy? The story, I forget right now. Where were they, the flies? It was just like a scene on the Lord of the Flies. It fascinated me as a kid to think that you can make something that makeshift and actually do it. Well, I don't know if it's an artist. I think it's a nut bar more than an artist, but... Now here, this, this really is the, where these... You can't, you see, I find it really hard to capture this, but it's actually dog print, frozen. And you notice in the paper, they just found this area where these dinosaur tracks have been found, they were in India. So you can imagine stumbling across this plane and then that's how, anyways. So that's what I'm trying here. This is sort of like a frozen dog tracks. 10 seconds, after 10 seconds, Andre says, the camera should lead somewhere. So most of my shots, I film according to his doctrine. I really quite like the fact that he is, um, is experienced and that he's um, knowledgeable. Plus just the way he is. I, I really have enjoyed meeting Andre. I find him very, uh, a very real person and in love with his craft. I mean, a little kid that gets to experience him now on tour, I think would just be launched into a whole new way of, of expressing him or herself, something that we need in the schooling system. You know, like look at the snow hanging on it. You got a, a snail shell. I don't know how you both hold them up. This, this is a really neat pattern, though, eh? And again, I'm trying to figure out something about patterns. There's a pattern of a story, a pattern of fabric. There's something, again, I'm not really sure what it is, but I'm going to find it, because that's what my journey is. It's the journey to become an artist. Somewhere in all of this composition or body of work, there's a pattern that's going to provide me with great joy. Well, money's never been a driving force. If it is, if you're, you're an artist, you know, it doesn't really work that way. Most artists make more money when they're dead than when they're alive. Now, come and see this later on. Like, look at this composition. And this is one of the nicest thing about this camera is starting to fade, and you can't see. I can't focus in. So that's kind of a neat little footnote when you think of how, how multi-layered he is. What's, the, what, what's that? I didn't hear anything. Oh, that's all right. It doesn't matter. You don't have to have everything. You should be asking questions. I was just sort of giving you a run-on commentary. And if that's adequate for you, then... So this one, I'm shooting development of this shot, but you can always override it. How so? Just by changing the shutter speed.
and then you've got the iris, right? You can change the, the size of the, or the amount of light come in from the side of the camera. So now I've moved it to one, or to 11, which is, which is not very much light. So I think uh, I'm going to change it, eh? how much of a difference is it? It's not a whole lot. But it changes the, the appearance of the ice for me on this picture. So I'm trying to adjust or compensate for that. But one nice thing about a movie camera, unlike uh, a still, you get the patterns in the, of the water, or the, the movement of the water, and I find that that's really quite inviting with my, my development of movie camera. I never would have done that before. So now I stopped it down to 11, because what it does is it accentuates the composition of the water and the ice more, it shows, I think, more of a detail. Okay, so let's walk up here. I think it'd be moving up this way. Just think of what those poor ducks are feeling. But I mean, I've, logged, I've taken a lot of pictures of this. Two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. After ten, it should go somewhere. Thank you, Andre. I'll remember that every time I do this with Farm. But it's just a long, I'm going to walk up and around the bend, guys, and I think that will call it. I don't know what else you want. But the whole idea for me is that I'm trying to, oh, Look at these patterns, they're more like swirls. Of course, if I describe anything, it's usually about food. So this is like chocolate swirl ice cream. These beautiful little patterns in this, this. I'm playing around with the idea of shooting the pan. You know, Peter says a pan should always lead somewhere. I think a pan should always show composition of something, so here goes. Over here, over there. The drawn it better. The fact that it's done just natural, I just find it really, really inspirational. So that's what I do. I walk around a lot in this state. Look at this, look at these patterns, look at these lines, eh? It's almost like a ghost appearing. Like, look at this, guys. See, look at the, look at the lines right here. It just, you know, so that's just, so we'll just go up here a little bit, and then we...
have a real hard time telling myself to stop. Because I keep on going, oh, just over that bend, just over that bend, just over that corner. And when it's frozen here, or when there's snow, my mom and I and whoever comes to visit for my family use these cross-country ski here. We do this regularly. So we come right out of the back door, right onto this, and to Black Rapids, five kilometers. My mom will walk, ski that regularly, five kilometers one way. My mom's 83 years old, so it's, it's a lot of fun to be around someone that's so motivated. The fact that I'm a descendant of her, direct descendant, is kind of neat because I hope it stays with me for a long period of time. So unlike the other pictures, this one's got a distinct rock change. You can see that it's got a real foundation to it. So I kind of like that idea. And then if you look over my shoulder, the bass river I was telling you about, it's right over here. Because the bass are an attack fish. And um, they go from a very shallow area to a little bit deeper area. And we'll and I had a thrill. Every year, every year, every night before I went to school, I used to bring a canoe down here and fish. Like I used to have like six hours, well, I used to have about a six hour day before my school even started because I used to do a golden mail paper route as a little paper boy. I had this beautiful little dog that followed me everywhere. One nice thing about dogs and kids, that if, you, if you're a good person, dogs and kids usually like you a lot. I've sort of been blessed with that, I must admit. I do like the pad. I do. So here, this is, you see where it is? This is the shallow, shallow, shallow. So you can see how shallow the water is. Then all of a sudden it dips. And this rock face, of course there's Tony's lesson, remember? This rock face right here is the ledge. Oh, should have had that right here. There's such a subtle change in the water. But bang, often, often bass fishing, all with a surface plug. And if I wasn't so lazy, I would have walked right on home. I could do this right out of my, my mom's backyard. Some more. I don't see. I think I'll bring it back up to where the other ones were. I really. Anyways, Nelson, do you want anything else? Do you want a close up or you got most of them? Do you want to ask any other questions? No, actually, put me on. Okay, so then.